Now, the latest from ITV News in the West Country. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm live in Plymouth where a gunman killed five people, including a three-year-old girl. Coming up tonight... How a summer's evening in Devon turned into a horrific mass shooting. Many people in Keyham witnessed what happened. It's, it's violent, it's terrifying. It, was, it literally felt like a living nightmare. I felt like I was being hunted. It was horrible. This is the man who carried out the attack. Who was he and what drove him to kill so ruthlessly and seemingly randomly? We'll be live at Derriford Hospital where a critical incident was declared. Two people are still being treated for gunshot wounds. But in tragedy comes togetherness, how this close-knit community has united in grief. Good evening. The most horrific of crimes took place last night here in Keyham. You can probably still see a lot of the police activity going on behind me. Not only did he shoot and kill four adults, but also a three-year-old girl. The gunman then turned the gun on himself. Now, this is the worst shooting of its kind that's happened in more than 10 years. Now, it was about this time last night, in fact, that the police began to get calls. It was about 10 past six, and they received a lot of them, I understand, from people who live here who heard and even saw what happened. Sam Blackledge has this report. It had started off as just a normal, quiet Thursday evening. Then, chaos, gunshots, confusion, Within minutes, six people were dead. Devon and Cornwall Police's Chief Constable, Sean Sawyer, explained how the shocking events unfolded. It is our understanding, and I can confirm, that a man known as Jake Davison, aged 22, had murdered a woman at an address in Biddick Drive using a firearm. Mr Davison then left that address, entered Biddick Drive, where he immediately shot and killed a very young girl. He also shot and killed the male relative of that girl. This was a truly shocking event and was witnessed by members of the public. Further along Biddick Drive, he aimed and shot at two local residents, a man and a woman, who've received significant, but we understand at present, not life-threatening injuries. They are currently being treated at a local hospital and supported by specialist officers. From there, Mr. Davison entered adjacent parkland where he immediately shot a man who died at the scene. And thereafter, he moved to Henderson Place where he shot a woman who, despite the best endeavours of first aiders at the scene, later died at Derriford Hospital. Eyewitnesses have told us that then Mr Davison turned the gun upon himself, taking his own life. Neighbours who witnessed the carnage were last night struggling to find the right words. I was at work and then driving home and it was awful really. I see police and ambulances, I'm like, oh, what's going on? I see some lead on the road. I was like, oh, maybe it's like some like, you know, heart attack or something, not something that bad. And then a couple of seconds later, I'm getting told by everyone that it's a shooting. And many people, many people died, and it's, it's, it's horrible. It's really horrible. The young girl among the dead was later confirmed to have been just three years old, a revelation which left the city stunned and heartbroken. It's a family. It's not just the people that were lost or the person that done it. It's the whole ripple effect. There's friends, there's families, there's colleagues. And if, if what some of the rumours are being said are true, there's, there's going to be a lot, a lot of people in a lot of pain. And, um, yeah, I can't quite imagine how a lot of people are going to deal with that here. And I think it probably will knock a lot of the community in Plymouth quite hard. Early this morning, with the eyes of the world focused on this small corner of Plymouth, the police continued to work. Forensics officers combing the area for evidence. A view of this city that we don't often see. 
and we hope will never be repeated. Attention turned to the gunman. He was a licensed firearms holder. He was known to the police. His background is now being investigated. The days and weeks ahead will be painful. There will be many questions, like how and why, and could this have been stopped? But for now, those questions will have to wait. The city of Plymouth is in mourning. And Sam is live at Crown Hill Police Station for us this evening. And Sam, I understand there have been uh, some updates in the last half an hour or so. Yes, Kylie, just a short time ago, Devon and Cornwall Police issued the very latest update on this story, confirming the identity of those who died last night. They are Maxine Davison, aged 50, who was the mother of the gunman, Stephen Washington, aged 59, Kate Shepherd, aged 66, and perhaps most shocking of all, three-year-old Sophie Martin and her father, 43-year-old Lee Martin. Well, now that those names have been publicly released, tributes will surely start to flood in over the coming days. We've already seen flowers being laid at the scene, both by family and friends and by well-wishers. Now, despite everything that's happened in Plymouth over the past 24 hours and those questions that need to be asked, the focus this evening must surely be on those five Plymouth people who have lost their lives. Indeed, Sam Blackledge, thank you very much. Well, we'll hear more from Sean Sawyer, the Chief Constable, in a few moments about what his officers saw when they got here. But it was, of course, the people who live here who were first on the scene. And one of those was local resident um, Peggy Holiday. And you may find some of what she says in her account distressing. Literally, as um, I approached the road, um, there was running and screaming from an assortment of different people. Um, I heard gunshots, but I thought they were fireworks. Um, I had, my brain didn't even conceive the idea that they were um, gunshots. I thought they were fireworks. And uh, I headed up the road following the crowd of people, and it was just violence, sheer violence. Um, a couple of the gunshots went off and I ran opposite a pub and the owner came out and he, he, he shouted at me, he just went, get in here, get in here now. And so I forward rolled into the pub and um, I literally clung underneath one of the pool tables, hung on for dear life and I froze. Um, he locked the door and he closed the windows and there were others in there as well. And um, at that point I, I phoned my mum and because I got a whole bunch of text messages from family members saying, where are you? There's, a sh there's shooting going on. Um, and uh, I said, there's, there's shooting. It's, it's violent. It's terrifying. It, was, it literally felt like a living nightmare. I felt like I was being hunted. It was horrible. Peggy Holiday there. Now, it took shooter Jake Davison just 10 minutes to take six lives, ending with his own. Here's Robert Murphy on how he brought terror to this neighbourhood. From his bedroom, Jake Davison recorded rambling talks about his hardship and self-loathing. I haven't had good things happen here and there, but for the most part, it's just been me against the world. It's, it's just been me fighting an uphill battle he posted on Facebook and elsewhere online, referring to incels, an online community of lonely, isolated, single men. Today, an expert who spent three years researching incels said these chat rooms are dark corners of the internet. His behaviour, the, 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 the points he raises about being a virgin and unsuccessful with women um, and, and how awful his life is, that is fundamental to the community. At the heart of involuntary celibacy is a hatred of women. And most women, a lot of women, are very simple-minded and they ain't all that bright. You know, social media and thinking they're princesses and all this. Unlike Jake Davison, the vast majority of people who identify with incels would not resort to violence. Others have been responsible for horrific murders, mostly in America.
it's really important that we emphasize that these communities are not a fun space to be in. Mm. They're also incredibly harmful for vulnerable, disillusioned, perhaps depressed people, men that go there looking for support, looking for solidarity, and instead they're met with encouragement to self-loathe even further. You know, a lot of incels say, oh, cope, 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 cope. But they do kind of have a point, you know, some people... Online, Davison found a sense of belonging. How much this encouraged his massacre is now under investigation. Roberts Murphy, ITV News. We can see here there are still so many police officers and police activity tonight. They've been here all day talking to residents and keeping those cordons in place at 13 different sites uh, around this area. Now, Chief Constable Sean Sawyer has been in the police force for 35 years and he is now, of course, the Chief Constable. Now, I imagine that this must have been the hardest 24 hours of his career. I spoke to him earlier. I think I joined the people of Plymouth and the wider southwest in, in great sadness today. It's extraordinarily sad, um, but the professionalism of the people who s safeguard the people of Plymouth was extraordinarily overnight, including the city council, the responding officers. But the biggest thing was to view that sense of courage from the public. Last night, the resilience, the patience, it was a very difficult. It ran over several hours and we will now continue over several days and months. And, and that sense of resilience and pride in the city has and will be tested. You know, emotions will ebb and flow over the coming weeks as more information comes out. Uh, and I really was grateful to see last night the support the public gave us and the bravery and fortitude of frontline officers and staff. I was going to ask about your officers, actually. Are you, are you concerned for them, those who were responding to the scene and must, must have seen some absolutely horrific things? Absolutely, them, but also the public as well. And when we say frontline staff, remember we had call handlers who were taking that initial call, were assessing a dynamic situation that becomes a fire administration that can hear the tension in the voice as officers arrived. So the entirety, and then indeed the forensics officers. So we think of those who run towards danger. There are those who are also managing that scene. And I have to commend our, 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 our ambulance and blue light services, our air ambulance, who gave their all last night. And presumably you have to do some work now to, to safeguard them and, and their mental and physical well-being. Indeed, but also that of the public. If I can just briefly read out for, for the members of the public affected last night who saw things uh, or have received on social media some things that have traumatised them. The Victim Support National Helpline is 0808-1689111. And um, some people will deal with this in different ways but I don't think anyone there last night won't be affected in some way. You, your officers were there within six minutes. Was that quick enough? It's an extraordinarily quick response, I, I would say, and I have to be clear, so they attended the Biddick Avenue call within six minutes. By then, of course, uh, Mr Davison had moved unbeknownst to them, so they've arrived within six minutes. The total time frame is ten minutes. Um, I've said already that I'm proud of the officers because both unarmed and armed kept going. They kept running towards that. The other issue is I think we do take for granted this idea of six minutes and although we're a vibrant city, anywhere else in the force area, I'm not so sure we would have been looking at that other than possibly Exeter and parts of Bodmin. Had this been in a rural area, then the nature of an armed response team is it will be many tens of minutes. So terribly tragic last night but I think we have to get acclimatized to that in most force areas like ours armed response teams are covering a huge geography and a response time of six minutes I would say is highly commendable. Presumably a lot of the work starts for you now doesn't it? Absolutely with 13 scenes in terms of the investigation but the work which is about supporting the people of Plymouth that will continue for months if not years. That was Chief Constable Sean Sawyer talking to me a little earlier. Now, as we heard, there are two people who are still in hospital being treated for gunshot wounds. They're at Derriford Hospital, which is where we can join Bob Cruz now. Bob, is there any update on how they are? 
Well, Kylie, what we've been told is that Jake Davison took aim and shot these two people in the street, a 53-year-old woman and a 33-year-old man. We're told that their injuries are not life-threatening, but we are told that the injuries are significant. And as you might expect with a shooting incident like this, potentially life-changing too, and they both are still being treated in hospital. A lot of emergency medical resources responded to the scene last night. Uh, multiple ambulances, doctors, paramedics and air ambulances. We had the very unusual sight of four air ambulances responding to the same scene. Two from Devon, the Cornwall Air Ambulance as well, and one from Dorset and Somerset. And Devon Air Ambulance today told us this was an exceptional incident. Our crews are dealing with critical incidents and trauma every day of the week. And often, um, you know, they, they deal with incidents that are equally as harrowing, but it's really the scale of this. Um, in a year, typically, we may have one or two shootings in a year that we would attend, but that may be just one singular patient. However, this was a handful and the magnitude of this was, was really quite shocking. The patients were actually brought to Derriford Hospital in the end by land ambulance because of how close it is to the scene. But crew from the air ambulance rode along with them in the land ambulance because of their specialist skill set in dealing with critical care and trauma like this. Uh, we've had a statement from NHS Devon this evening on behalf of Derriford Hospital saying how shocked and saddened everybody is by what happened last night. Also thanking all the staff who responded last night and today at people working additional shifts to care for those who've been affected and also care for those in the community too. Bob Cruz, thank you very much for that. Well, joining me now is Luke Pollard. Luke, you're, of course, the uh, local MP for this area. I just want to ask you how, how you are today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty rubbish, and I imagine most of the people in our community are, are as well. Mm -hmm. The news of the shooting yesterday, I think, has hit us really hard as a community, and the naming of the young girl who was shot, I think, has uh, compounded this because we're supposed to look out for young people and protect them and I think that has made the pain of this mass shooting so much harder for so many people in the community but the idea that this happens in Plymouth this doesn't happen in Plymouth until it did yesterday and that is uh, hard for our community to come to terms with and it will take some time for people to really process mm. what's happened. And Luke of course this isn't just your constituency is it? it's, your, it's your home too so does it do you think it has more effect on you because of that? Well, there's lots of people for whom Plymouth's their home and, and what happens here matters. Yeah. And in a community like Keyham, where neighbours know each other, families live close together and everyone looks out for each other, it's a tight-knit community, what happens in one household has an effect on the entire community. So when something like this happens, it is something that matters to all of us as a city and that's why we've seen such a strong community response over the past few days people coming together the uh, local school uh, reopening to provide community services our churches being safe places for the community and we will get through this as a community but it will take time but we will do that together and the candlelight vigil uh, tonight at nine o'clock is one moment the first moment where the community can come together to uh, to mourn to grieve and to uh, share with each other their thoughts and, uh, and real fears about what's happened. Has it surprised you that people have come together, or is that what you expected? No, I think when anything goes wrong, it's always tempting to look for the, the perpetrator. But behind the perpetrator, there are always people who help. Look for the helpers. Mm. And what we've seen today uh, is some utterly grim news coming out but we've seen the community look after one another step forward we've seen the council housing uh, um, uh, social services the nhs mental health support all step forward to provide support for our entire community from uh, from the youngest who young children who witnessed the attack through to some of the oldest in our community to make sure that we're coming together and getting through it together and that is the strength of uh, Keyham, it's the strength of plymouth and this is a community with a lot of heart and my word, haven't we needed it? Yeah, and we've certainly seen it today. Luke, thank you very much for thank that. You. Well, there hasn't been a shooting, as we said, on the scale since 2010. And there have been questions asked about why Jake Davidson had this type of weapon and also whether our gun laws go far enough. Let's have this report now from Robert Murphy. 
It was Plymouth's darkest night, and whilst mass shootings are mercifully rare, it does nothing to detract from the horror of what happened here. Now how gun licences are granted is being questioned. When it comes to firearm licensing, that is absolutely what the police oversee. And clearly, I will be asking questions, um, definitely in terms of local policing and raising this with the Chief Constable. Derek Bird was responsible for Britain's last mass shooting by a civilian. The taxi driver killed 12 in Cumbria more than a decade ago. In 1996, 17 people, almost all children, were killed in the massacre at Dunblane. In 89, a man was killed and many more injured at a shooting in Monks Eaton on Tyne and Weir. And two years earlier, 16 were killed in Hungerford. Plymouth's is the country's fifth mass shooting. We probably allow people to have guns far too easily than they should do. Um, you know, unless you're a, a farmer, um, I don't see why people would, would need to have a gun. Our gun laws are amongst the strictest in the world and some have been around for years. In 1870, licences were needed for anyone who wanted a gun outside of their home. In 1920, the Firearms Act then gave police the powers to deny licences to anyone who wasn't trusted. In 1997, handguns were almost completely banned. And then by 2006, the introduction of the Violent Crime Reduction Act covered imitation guns too. And two years ago, dangerous weapons were banned at home altogether. And the politician responsible for policing the UK's largest city says after the Plymouth shootings, more changes may be needed. Well, I think it's really important to wait and see what the police investigation uh, uncovers so we can ascertain the full facts. And if there's a need for any change in legislation, I'm sure we'll look into that. It may never be possible to fully comprehend what happened here and why. But in time, it may mean even stricter rules on who has a gun. David Wood, ITV News. David Wood with that report there. Now, uh, last night, if you were following events on social media, you will have seen so much comment and speculation and also some graphic images and videos from the scene here. Lucy McDade reports now on how some posts can be hugely damaging. As shots were still being fired, videos were being posted online. This is the aftermath of last night's event. Too graphic to share in its entirety on this programme, but already seen by thousands, if not millions, online. For many scrolling on their phones, it was impossible to avoid. If you're tweeting, if you're Snapchatting, if you're Instagramming, take a pause before you do anything and think about what the consequences are likely to be. It may be exciting for you, but it's not entertainment. Um, it has a dramatic effect on people. Mixed amongst the images were messages asking people not to share their footage. Police in Plymouth begged those doing so to stop, as did the city's MPs, maybe from different parties, but united in anger. This morning, Devon and Cornwall's Police and Crime Commissioner repeated the message. I don't think it's um, helpful for any of the families involved to actually see some of that. So please hold on to your footage and, and please don't share. While well, don't share is the message from the authorities, support organisations are urging those affected by what they've seen to speak up. This isn't just about a location of an incident as much as that's the direct effect on that community. Social media means it's across the country and our services are available across, the, uh, across England and Wales. For police who are now using videos like this to try and piece together what happened here, there are benefits to using social media, but huge problems too. Lucy McDade, ITV News. Now, I've heard throughout the programme what a tight-knit community this is, and we hear that phrase an awful lot, don't we? But Jackie Bird now reports on how this community really has been united by grief. I'm feeling quite nervous, even, even though my my mum said um, about he's already died, but I'm still kind of nervous. The words of a seven-year-old boy struggling, as we all are, to come to terms with what's happened on his doorstep. His mum, Carol, was bringing him home from the park when it all unravelled. But it, it, it unsettles you, you now think, you know, I was going to take Adam to the park today, um, but you're a little bit 
yeah, I'm, I'm scared. Um, I know, you know, there's been word that, you know, the guy's been caught, but you're still now very, I think it makes everybody sort of, you know, a little bit more wary. John Brill, too, had a frantic dash to find his 14-year-old daughter after she witnessed the incident in the park. She sort of mentioned that she walked right through the scene, um, saw a lady in a, in a sort of a doorway with a, with a wound, and then um, the police basically told her and a friend to run. They looked down a back lane and saw a chap, which is obviously, I've confirmed with her with a picture, that it's obviously the chap in question. And this is the reason that this community has felt the need to come together today. This is a community in shock. They don't really quite know what to do. But what they have done is open up this church behind me and the school up the road. It's a place where people can come, there are people they can talk to and just support each other and do what this community does best, look after each other. There is a real sense, you can feel that as soon as you walk the streets and the people that we've met and spoke to, that's the overwhelming feeling that we're getting, is that people are just shocked by the events that have happened. There's an event on the old last night and we were, it was extraordinary to see the messages being shared between people um, through the social media, phone calls, um, finding out how one another were, um, which uh, is, is very much part of this area. In a day or two, I guess the media and folk move on, don't they? But the scars and the pain is left in the community and there will be a lot of work for all sorts of people to do, to counsel and support and help uh, and to remember that people's lives have been affected for, forever in, in some cases. The events of the last 24 hours are still sinking in, but by looking after each other, they will get through it. And Jackie has joined me, as you can see. And Jackie, you've been a journalist actually in Plymouth for 35 years. I just want to hear your reflections on what's happened here. Well, Kylie, Plymouth is not just a city. It's, it's a series of little villages, really. We're here in Keyham, there's North Prospect and Barn Barton. They're tight-knit communities, as Luke Pollard has already, already said. People know each other and they look after each other. And that's certainly what we've seen here today. No more than I would have expected in all the time that I have worked here in Plymouth. The city has come together. On Monday, there's going to be a minute silence um, in the city. There's also going to light up Smeaton's Tower to um, remember those who have been lost. This is a city that looks after its own, and it's certainly something that we've seen here in spades today. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Jackie. Thank you very much indeed. And that is all from us here this evening. There is, of course, plenty more news from our region. It's all on our website. We'll have updates during our bulletins across the weekend, too. The national and international news is next and the local weather forecast. But from all of us here, thank you very much indeed for watching. Good night. <laughs>